Well, I'm excited to preach to you this morning. Uh, if you will, turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 33, the 33rd Psalm. I'm going to preach a message that the Lord has given me over the last couple of weeks. And uh, again, go with me to the 33rd Psalm, and I'm only going to read one verse, verse 3, and then I'm going to preach. Amen. Amen. And uh, I may stay up here. I may travel around the room today. I don't know. I try to be nice to the camera people when I go out and preach in churches because I can be hard to keep up with. Psalm 33, verse 3, it says, Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Today I want to talk to you on a message that I'm calling the composition of a new song. The composition of of a new song. How many of you have been in church for a while? Been, I'm not talking about today. I know some of y'all been here for hours, but I'm talking about you've, you've been around church for several years, maybe, a, maybe your whole life. Maybe you were saved. I know people who were born under the pew. Hallelujah. People have been saved for forever. Well, if you've been saved at least as long as I have, I'm a veteran of the faith at this point, you have at some point heard a worship leader or a pastor you may have heard Jordan say it at some point, amen. But someone came up on the platform and in that moment when the service got real sweet and you could sense the presence of the Lord moving in the atmosphere, somebody admonished, encouraged, incited the room to sing a new song to the Lord. Have you ever heard somebody do that? They stood and they said, sing a new song to the Lord this morning, church. Now I'll tell you, not only have I heard it, I have been guilty of saying it myself. I get up and I say this, and I would like to tell you that all of these messages come from prayer. They don't. Sometimes they come from me sitting in the pew and hearing something, and I, something will get in my crawl. I don't, that's Southern for it. it. It agitates me all of a sudden. And something will get in my crawl, and I'll say, I'm going to preach on that. And a few weeks ago, I was in church, and the worship leader got up, and he said, just sing a new song. Just sing a new song. And, and you know, and people are responding to it, but nothing's really happening in it. It occurred to me that sometimes we say things like this, and we say them so often, we say them so frequently that they end up just falling deftly on us. We have no idea what it means. We have no idea what to do with that instruction. Yet we sit back and we amen it. We say, yes, yes, we should do that. Whatever that is, whatever that thing is, we, we should do it. it to, to some degree, it becomes background noise in our services, in our churches. In fact, you would think that as often as you hear it in, in worship services, especially in Pentecostal realms, you would think that uh, the Bible was littered with this phrase, new song. You would think that there were admonitions throughout all of the Scripture saying, sing a new song, sing a new song. But did you know, in fact, that that phrase only shows up in the Scripture nine times? Most of them are in the Psalms, one of them is in Isaiah, two of them are in Revelation. So I mean, it's got good company for sure, but only shows up nine times. So let's, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to sing a new song to the Lord, what it means to have a new song, what the composition of a new song is, but I'll kind of give you the punchline up front so you'll know where we're headed. And it's this, that new songs are about new victories. New songs are about new victories. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure nobody in the room would argue with this, but music is powerful. Music is powerful. Music has the power to comfort us, encourage us, motivate us. I, I don't know when you were a teenager, if you ever had a boyfriend or a girlfriend break up with you and it just you were just devastated. And there's something about turning on a a sad song, and it just, it's like the balm of Gilead. It just, it comforts your soul. It does something for you. But, but also, I don't know if you've ever been at the gym. I wouldn't have seen you there since I uh, don't go. Um, I am actually down about 20 pounds. I don't know if y'all can tell. I know I'm hard to see up here. I'm, I'm, I'm wasting away. 
And, uh, but but I, I, if you've ever been to the gym and you got to that moment where you needed to lift a weight that was a little heavier, or you needed to run a little bit further, you needed to do another rep of some of those P90X exercises, and, and you got to that moment and you don't have the strength left, there's something about reaching down and turning that boom box up just a little bit louder that tends to make it where you find the strength in yourself to go a little further. Music is powerful. Music is powerful. Now, if we were to take the theological position on music, music is actually not just powerful, but music is a form of dominion. Music's a form of domination. Music can help you win in a scenario. Uh, the kings of Israel would send the musicians out in front of the army. You think about that. You would think your front line would be the guy with the AK-47, not the guy with the trumpet. But they said, we're going to send the musicians in front of the army. Do you know why they did that? Because they knew that the enemy would hear the sound of Israel approaching. And the enemy kings, the enemy armies would say, the God of Israel doth whoopeth our behind. <laughs> they would know it was a form of domination. The first time that anything about music is mentioned in the Bible, it is talking about domination, dominion. Genesis chapter 4, three brothers are mentioned who are the uh, engineers, they are the inventors, they are the, the patriarchs of industry that we still operate in today. Those brothers were Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal Cain. How many of you know, the Bible has got great names, right? Like, you know, and you named your son Bob. You know, I mean, like, they've got great names. And so these three brothers... They were the head of industries. They created industries. Jabal was the first who had livestock and cattle and lived in tents, and he was, he was a rancher. He was, so if you see people ranching, they're, they're in the lineage of Jabal. And if you see people who work with uh, mechanics or weapons or any kind of metal work, steel workers, iron workers, they're in the lineage of, of Tubal Cain. He was the one who discovered Metal. He was the first to create weapons and engineer different uh, types of mechanisms. But then there was another brother, and his name was Jubal, just like the word Jubilee. His name was Jubal. He was the father of all of those who play instruments, all those who play instruments of brass, all those who play instruments of strings. I imagine he probably got some, some, some hides from Jabal and created some drums as well. And these three brothers created industries that took dominion over the earth to the point that they're still major industries today. Still major industries today. Music is powerful. Music's a form of domination. But today what I want to talk to you about is what comprises a new song. What are the components? What's the composition of a new song. But I want you to know that the composition of a new song is not so much musical. I could do a master class on something musical today. I've done it for years, but I, that's not my intention. It's not so much musical. It's the realities of the spiritual and physical experiences that we walk through. It's, it's about those realities. So I I'm kind of a list preacher. I like to give you points. I keep it real simple, real straight down. And I always like to start where everybody can start, no matter where you're at in your faith journey. So number one, and I want you to write these down today. We're talking about the composition of a new song because new songs are about new victories. Number one, the first component of a new song is a response. It's a response. Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 says this, it says, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Just to give you a little bit of background information on what's happening in this passage, the, 
The nation of Israel, the children of Israel have been dispossessed from a land that God had given them hundreds of years earlier, uh, several thousand years that it had been promised to them, and they have been dispossessed from the land. They have been taken out. They've been taken captive. They've been put in captivity in other lands under enemy nations and, and enemy militaries, and, and they've been removed from their inheritance. And at this time, and if you read in your Bible, this is all in the time of, of books like Nehemiah, Ezra, Esther, uh, uh, Zechariah, books like that you can read and see what's going on in this time frame. And at this time, there are uh, priests who are in uh, exile, and there are people who are Jews. They are the children of Israel, but they have found themselves in government positions. And, and these, these people have somehow gained favor with a king in Israel, or a king in exile. And the king allows them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of God that the enemy armies have come in, they have broken down, they have torn down, they have pillaged, they have stolen, they have taken from, and they get permission to go back and build it. And so they head towards Jerusalem, they begin to rebuild the temple, and uh, once they lay the foundation of the temple, the priests gather everyone together who's working on it, and they say, this seems like a significant moment we're going to call a commemorative church service. And that's exactly what they do. They call in the musicians. They call in some other priests. They call in the remnant of Israel that's remaining in Jerusalem. And they come to the Temple Mount where they are going to have a commemorative service at the laying of the foundation of the temple that is being rebuilt. And when they get there, they realize they have no new songs to sing. There's no Maverick City of the day. There's no Elevation Church of the day. There's no Fred Hammond to call upon. There's nobody with new songs because one of the psalmists said, how can we sing the song of the Lord in a foreign land? There's no fresh song. So what they do is they call upon songs that had been in their repertoire for hundreds of years that King David had written. It would be like me rolling up in here today and singing Amazing Grace. Even if you don't know the words, you know the tune. If you don't know it, you can fake it. Amen. It would be singing a song like that. These were songs that they knew from their history. They were songs that were in their inheritance. And they gathered around and they began to respond to the songs of David and sing them with vibrance and sing them with authority and sing them responsively. See, as the foundation in your life is being laid, as the foundation of your faith is being laid, as you're restoring yourself to the things that God wants to do in your life, you may not have all the details, you may not have all the theology. You may not have all the experience. And that's okay. It would be unfair to look at you and say, with no structure whatsoever, reach down and sing a new song. Come up with something on the fly and just express it to the Lord. But you don't have to do that. What you can do is you can reach into that song that's in the atmosphere of the room. See, we've got something real neat here. We got this giant screen with words on it. And when you come into the house of the Lord and the music begins to go forth and, and the worship begins to rise in the room, you can grab the words off of that screen and you can begin to sing the words that are on that screen and, and something will happen over time where those words will get down into your spirit. And over time, they start to get in your spirit and suddenly you'll find that those words start to become the story of your life and faith. And as those words shape you and they're down in your spirit, you're going to start to see God do some incredible things in your life. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that faith comes by hearing. But it also says that salvation comes by calling on the name of the Lord. I need you to hear me. The faith will come through hearing, but the breakthrough comes through the responding, through the speaking, through the confessing, through the calling on the name of the Most High God. Somebody ought to say amen this morning. Hallelujah. Number two, 
as the song of the Lord that you're picking up in the house that you're being responsive to begins to shape your life, you'll begin to see the Lord doing great works in your life. You'll experience the power of God in your life. Which brings us to number two. A new song includes a testimony. A new song includes a testimony. In Judges chapter 4, we see a story of a woman named Deborah. Deborah was a prophetess in Israel. She was a judge in Israel. She was a leader amongst her people. And I, I don't want to tell the whole story of Deborah. I just want to point one thing out that happened with her. Deborah, in her working with the military of Israel, uh, she prophesied that something would happen to an enemy commander, an enemy general. She prophesied to the military of Israel. She said, this enemy general will not be killed by one of you. He will not be brought down by anyone in the military. Rather, he's going to be given into the hands of a woman. This, this enemy uh, general indeed goes into the tent of a woman to hide, ask for water. She gives him milk. That specific detail to something I'm going to share with you in just a second. She gives him milk. She hides him under a rug. And then she takes a tent peg and drives it through his temple and kills him right there. Some of y'all are worried about being thrown under the bus. You need to get worried about being thrown under the rug. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And so she, she, she kills him and the prophecy is fulfilled. Well, in Judges chapter 5, you have the song of Deborah. It's the song of Deborah. And in the song of Deborah, I want you to listen to this specific verse. Starting in verse 24, it says, Most blessed of women be Jael. That was the woman whose tent the enemy general went in to hide in. The wife of Heber, the Kenite. Of tent-dwelling women most blessed. He asked for water and she gave him milk. She bought him curds in a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera, the, en the enemy general. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. See, what happens is, is your experience becomes testimony and your testimony is part of your new song. It gives you the opportunity to draw on your own experience, take it, form it into a declaration of what God has done, and send it back to the Lord as worship. It also gives you the opportunity to create new victory out of your testimony because new songs are about new victories. We're about to celebrate a very special birthday in our house. My youngest daughter is going to be 11 years old, and I'm keenly aware that the 11th birthday is not that big of a deal. But my daughter was born on March 31st, 2013, and she was also born on Easter Sunday. This is the first year that those two things happen on the same day since she was born. My daughter was born, she was born at 24 weeks old, meaning for the men in the room about four months early. That's because I didn't know what that meant either. I'm like, 24 weeks, that doesn't sound good, but I'm not real sure what it means. She was one pound, 13 ounces when she was born. We thought she was going to die. It was a dire and desperate situation. To compound that, she was born on Easter. I'm a preacher. I was busy at the church for Easter Sunday. I mean, her timing is just not impeccable. Um, and to this day, she'll hit you with something right as you're walking out the door. <laughs> hey, by the way, can you do this? So that's Allie. But I have a testimony for you. I want to tell you, God miraculously raised her up. We thought she was going to die, but over a three-month period, we saw her get better and better and better and gain more weight and more weight and more weight. There's been no defect. There's been no problem with her. None of the issues that they said that we would see have we seen. At one point, a doctor took me aside and literally told me she might have trouble drawing circles. And I thought, 
I have trouble drawing circles. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I, don't, I think we're going to see that, I think. Um, but, so, but we've had no problem with her whatsoever. Her health has been impeccable. God raised her up. That's a testimony. That's a testimony in our life. But that's not where the testimony ends. Allie was in the hospital for three months. And I don't know if y'all know, but those pills that they give you at the hospital cost $8,000 a pop. And it was expensive. Allie cost right under a million dollars in her first three months. Right under it. I mean, I'm talking $970 something thousand dollars. Our insurance covered $10,000 of it. Thank you, Blue Cross. Just not helping a lot today. But my wife walked into the financial aid office one day and went and sat down and talked to this lady. And the lady, this was at the hospital. The lady typed some information in the computer and she said, I have never seen this happen before, but everything is going to be paid for. The whole bill will be paid for. My wife goes to ask her a question. And by the time my wife got the second word out of her mouth, the lady held her hand up at her and said, I have never seen this before. Never come to this office or ask another question. You need to stand up and leave. It was a miraculous bill being paid. Hallelujah. So today, when I have health issues, which by the way, I almost died two years ago. I was in the hospital for 10 days. That only cost $117,000 because I'm on a budget. Hallelujah. And so I went into the hospital. I almost died. But guess what? Whenever we have health issues, we look at those health issues and we don't just sing a song of response. We sing a song of testimony. When I've got health problems, when my wife has health problems, we sing the song of Allison Mayfield to whatever's coming against us. Whenever we have money problems, and I don't know if y'all know this, but things have not been great over the last few years. The economy is a little funny. But when I have money problems, when I've got money issues, you know what I do? I look them in the face and I sing the song of Allison Mayfield because I've seen God come through on my behalf. If you don't shout, I will. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And they conquered by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Amen. Number three, your song becomes prophetic. Your song becomes prophetic. I'm sure we all know the story of David and Goliath. But just as a point of refresher, Goliath is this giant who is on the side of an enemy of Israel and he is challenging military personnel. He is taunting the king. Nobody in the military, no man in Israel, no king in Israel is willing to stand up against this giant. Now, listen to me. I don't know how big Goliath was. But I know he had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. And folks, when you grow in extra fingers and toes, you one big son of a gun. Amen. And so he's a big giant. He's a big issue. He's a big problem. And nobody will stand up to him. But then there comes this boy from his daddy's shepherd field. He's about 15 years old at the time. And he comes out delivering lunch to his brothers one day and he says, I'm kind of sick of this giant. And David found it in himself somehow to rise up, to go out on the battlefield, and he kills this giant. He does it. He wins. It's a great story. There's tons of theology in there. It's fantastic. It's motivating. It's wonderful. But rarely do we talk about what happened right before he goes out there. In the chapter before David and Goliath, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the anointing for the kingship has been removed from the current king of Israel. And when the anointing is removed, an a, a, a oppressive spirit comes in and begins to taunt and torment the king. His name is Saul. And somebody in his assistant, somebody on his staff said, you know what? I know a boy named David, and he 
plays the guitar, and I think if we called him in, it would make it all better. And in verse 23 of 1 Samuel chapter 16, it says, And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. See, here's what I want you to understand. Before David ever went out and dealt with a giant, before David ever went out and dealt with a real issue standing in front of him, David got a song in his spirit. David got a song in his spirit and it determined how he was going to deal with that enemy. It determined how he was going to deal with that thing. See, understand this, that the song that David was getting in his heart in his father's sheep field made the way for the victory he got out on Israel's battlefield. Amen. And there's also something prophetic that's not even prophetic. See, some stuff's prophetic and some stuff's just good sense. And I imagine when David saw that Philistine giant named Goliath with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. This big old fella. I got a feeling he looked at him and he just common sense said to him, you know what, if I can drive off a demon with a guitar, I bet I can whoop that boy with a slingshot. Hallelujah. There's something about having a song in your spirit that becomes prophetic. See, when you've, when you've responded to the song in the room and you've got a song of testimony in you, you will know beyond the shadow of a doubt how things will turn out on your behalf and the prophetic will rise up in you and you'll step into a new song that produces a new victory. Somebody say yes. Hallelujah. So a new song is a response, it's a testimony, it's prophetic. But I want to show you one more thing, and I, I'm going to invite the worship team to come back. And we're going to sing a song to close the service out today. But I would be remiss if I talked to you about a new song, and I never talked to you about the first song that is in the Bible. The first song that's in the Bible is in Exodus chapter 15. It's the first song recorded in the Scripture. It's certainly not the first one sung, but it is the first one recorded in the Scripture. This happens right after Israel escapes slavery. They escape the oppression of the nation of Egypt. They escape their captors. And as they are headed towards freedom, they encounter the Red Sea. And as they encounter the Red Sea, they get there, they realize they can't go anywhere else. They are stuck. They are trapped. In the time that they have been fleeing, the Egyptian king, Pharaoh, has decided if they won't serve me, they won't serve anybody. I'm going to go after them and I'm going to kill them. And he gets the military together. They set out on horses and chariots and they begin to pursue the nation of Israel to the point of death. And as they see the Red Sea, everyone begins to panic. And then Moses, the leader of the people, gets a word from God. Go to that sea and raise your staff in the air and watch what I can do. And he does just that. And the waters wall up on each side. The Red Sea is parted right down the middle. It becomes almost like a pathway. What's really interesting in the story is that the, the ground becomes dry. There's not even any mud. That's how good God is. How detailed He is. And they begin to cross over the Red Sea. And once everybody, all several million of them, are crossed over the Red Sea... The Egyptians start to pass through. And once the last Israelite has stepped out of the Red Sea, Moses drops that staff and the Lord closes in the Red Sea on the Egyptians, taking out every single person who is uh, chasing Israel to the point of death. Once this happens, they do what hopefully anybody would do. They start to sing a song of praise to the Lord who has delivered them. And they begin to sing a song about the deliverance of the Lord, the salvation of the Lord, the, the miracle working power of the Lord, the grace of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord. And that's the first song in the Bible. But then if you flip to the end of your Bible in Revelation, Revelation chapter 15, you'll see the last song in the Bible. The first song in the Bible is called the Song of Moses. The last song is called the Song of the Lamb. 
Here's what's captivating. They're the same song. They're the same song. The first song and the last song in the Bible are the same song. And I don't know if y'all feel this way. I don't know if you sit back and you look around and it causes you a little bit of panic, but I'm well aware that the world is changing at a rapid pace. Things seem to be getting darker. The culture seems to be getting stranger. Things seem to be more wicked. I'm afraid to turn on network television in my house. I don't know what ABC and NBC and CBS is going to toss into my living room. Yes. Yes, Things are getting worse. At the same time, maybe you don't even have the bandwidth to look outside of the little sphere of atmosphere that goes around yourself. Maybe you've been feeling that way just about your situation. Maybe the money's not headed in the right direction. Maybe the health diagnosis is not headed in the right direction. Maybe your son or your daughter are not headed in the right direction. Your husband or your wife, maybe they're not headed in the right direction. Maybe you can't take another day of the dysfunction that you grew up with, another call from your mother or call from your father. Maybe things just aren't well in your world. But I want you to know this. God has not forgotten you. If you're watching on the internet today, listen to me. God has not forgotten you. He sees you. He's aware of you. He has not left you. But I need you to understand this. The first song and the last song are the same song. And that means when you call on the new song, you're calling on the same thing that they've called from the ancients. You're calling on the same thing that they call in the heavenlies today. It's the same song. Listen to me. If you don't hear anything else, hear this today. I want you to know that the same song still works. It's the same song. It's the same song promise. The testimonies are still sure. They're still coming in. Prayer still works. Praise still works. Worship still works. My friends, the altar still works. The cross still works. The blood still works. And it shall never, it shall never, it shall never lose its Power. When you call on His name, He's faithful to answer. He still saves. He still heals. He still delivers. He still sets free. And I think you ought to give Him a great praise in the house today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 